All right, uh, last class of the day, it's Feb 11. Um, so we have a help forum up. So everybody is, is forced into this, meaning you all get emails when someone posts up in there. So if you're stuck, if you have issues, you know, post up, uh, ask for help, like be descriptive with your issue and post some screenshots or something. And um, hopefully other students can get to you. Um, if not, I'll get to you. Or we now have a TA, Matt. Um, he's going to be here in lab time as well. So here's our lab times here in this class, in this classroom, Monday, four to six, Wednesday, three to three to five, or like three to six, Thursday, four to six. Um, and speaking of which, the last video was about test building. So wherever you currently are, go through the process of Building your scene, creating the folders, creating HTML files, zipping it all up, going to itch.io, creating an account, um, creating a new project, writing out the name, adding some screenshots, attaching the zip file, moving it from a draft state into a public or a published state, and then testing out the link. All right. So these are many steps. They're relatively simple, but there's always issues and there's always headaches. And the problem now is I have to get a date on this um, posted. But so you know that it's this Sunday, the 17th, um, at midnight. So meaning your post needs to be up. Your post includes project description, user flows, and a link to a workable project. And all this you should test before submitting. Again, here's the demo app. Now, you're going to learn this week, you're going to learn a lot of um, new new things you can do. And your, your app's going to change a lot this week. So your project description will morph and your user flows will morph. And you'll have something to actually deliver by this Sunday. But the problem is now we only have these three lab times and there's always going to be a percentage of you that for whatever reason the, the, the build process is going to fail and you're going to be this weekend you're going to be doing this whole workflow by yourself some of you are going to fail you're not going to be able to post Sunday at midnight and you're going to have a 25% deduction so this is why I said last week go through Follow me in the video and test build. doesn't matter if all you're doing is just clicking on a sphere. Just build something. Because some of you are going to wait till the weekend. Some of you, that build process is going to fail. And I'm not there because I offered more than enough lab time. And you're just going to have to take that 25% deduction. So I'm telling you now, do your test build. Why are you looking at me like that? Yeah. I just have like breath pain. Okay. Confused? Because you came in late, or is what I was saying? In general. Okay. Life? Or people, this class? People often tell me I look perplexed. Okay. I'm Just life's hard. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> but this assignment, are you good? Okay. So the one thing I'm telling you, do this video right here. Do that test build as soon as you can. And actually try to get it up on HIO because I know that there's issues. It's just going to be, a, it's just one of these things. Whenever someone like getting updates onto your personal NGAT website, and you've never done it before, <laughs> you're just going to run into issues. In all three classes, I can tell most of you haven't actually gone through all the videos. And I'm, every week I'm telling you that there's going to be an issue and I, I can't reverse my grade policies because you're not doing what I'm telling you to do. So give it a go. It's this video right here. This is the lab time. Um, so these uh, these three videos last week went through a lot of input. Um, I went through three different techniques of how to interpret user input based on where the mouse position is and then how to figure out a depth into the world. So the first script we went through was um, 
figuring out the mouse position and then just adding an arbitrary distance into the world. The second one, we created a ground plane who by default had a collider on it. And so whenever we clicked down to the world, it shot a ray out, basically a vector. And if from this mouse position where the camera's at, if it hits that plane, then yep, you hit a collider, we should go forward and spawn an object. If we say click over here, we're going to shoot a ray out into the world. It's never going to hit anything. It's an infinite void, and we don't spawn anything. Um, the third, the ray cast, had to deal with spawning a mathematical version of the plane, basically a simplified version of this plane right here, which was a Unity default primitive. It had a renderer on it, it had a collider, it had a material. This is like a stripped down version of it. The third one is just like, let's create this plane infinitely out into the world mathematically. You don't even see it. And it, if we read that we're hitting it on whatever point, we spawn a sphere. So the first version, let me turn this ground plane off. This is the version that I, because we already were kind of iterating on it. We were like, let's create custom prefab. Let's mess around with the distance. This is the one I end up messing around with this class. But this one, if I click play, hopefully I, I reverted the script back. Yeah, in this case, we're, we're spawning a, a prefab. I showed you we can create more complicated objects than just the Unity defaults of sphere, um, cylinder, cube. You can create game objects that are a series of these all rotated, scaled differently, with different colors on them. So I went through materials. And here we're just at a fixed distance, in this case 30 units out. We're reading in where the mouse position is and we're drawing. So it's basically like a like this invisible canvas, and we can change the distance. So let's say we want to spawn really close to the camera at 10 units out. And then we had this, um, we can implement a change value every time. So here, this paint stroke will get farther away, and I can reset it and do something else, make it move slower. Or if it's really far away, I can move this distance change toward the camera. So notice how um, the paint strokes start building up. It starts getting overwhelming. It fills up the screen. And then this is like my first step in. I'm, I'm offering or uh, I'm adding a new feature where it's actually destroying the paint strokes. So as I'm painting right now, my distance is behind the camera. So let me move it forward and increment this distance. And um, and you see how that these objects are getting destroyed. So eventually, if you keep painting, either like the whole canvas will get filled up and it's a poor user experience, or the memory will get filled up with all these game objects and your app will stop. So we destroy. Um, any three of these, real quickly, any three of these input features, these input scripts that I've went through in previous videos, you can use for your own app. So if you like this one where there is some type of ground plane, whether you see it or not, you can use this. Let me press the F key. And I'm just spawning spheres that are only on that plane. That plane can be visible or not visible. But I'm only spawning, spawning spheres in that, that plane. You can scale it up, you can scale it down, but it's like a finite drawing space, right? I can, now this script was from last week. Notice how like I, I can't destroy stuff. It's just sitting there. Now I got to like reset the, the, the editor, switch over to something else. So it's kind of annoying. And then this one, script three, Three. I don't think I have it up anymore. Oops. This one is creating that mathematical plane. And by default, let me just switch it to up. And if I click, let the script calculate. I'll, I'll explain why in a minute why it's pointing up. 
this one paints off basically to infinity, off to the horizon. And if I move the camera, it would just keep painting wherever the camera is pointed. So even if I turn that ground plane back on, I'm painting off of it as well. So this method that's creating the plane is receiving in two inputs. One's a vector, one's a float. The vector is saying, where is it pointing? In this case, vector up, if we remember, is just a pre-built vector. Should, should, here we go. Shorthand for writing vector 0, 1, 0. Only one, positive one in the y. So when a plane is sitting on the ground, and this is, we're talking about the, the normal, the perpendicular angle to it. If something's sitting like this ground, this floor, the normal's pointing up. So if I turn on this ground again, it's kind of like this arrow coming up. This is why we're looking down at it, and the render surface is up. So here we're like, oh, it's like a vertical canvas that we're painting on, the whole floor. So if we change this vector 3 to forward, and if I hover over it again, shorthand for writing 0, 0, 1, which we could write new vector 3, and in parentheses 0f, zero 0f, zero 1f, meaning only have um, z. This is the same as saying the shorthand, which is already a data structure, which is built for us, vector 3 forward. But when I do that and save it out, let me turn off. It's like basically we're going to take this ground plane, and if I rotate it toward, oh, that's not toward the camera. Yep, if I rotate it this way, toward the camera. Notice how its local orientation is now pointing toward the camera. Or if we look at our compass in Z. So if I undo that and just hide this ground plane and click play, we're basically painting in an infinite canvas that's pointed right at us or this mathematical plane that's now been like rotated toward the user and it's at world space zero. So the camera, if I click on it, is at world space negative 10 on the X. So it's kind of like our, our playing area, our virtual world is at world space zero, zero, zero. Our viewpoint, our eyes, the camera is 10 units off and we're kind of looking at world space zero. And we're spawning stuff at world space zero for easier math. So in this case, the canvas was rotated, and we're painting at it like it's this big horizontal canvas, which is actually very similar to the first script that was introduced, which is this screen to world space, basically figure out where the mouse position is in X and Y. And then we just add in an arbitrary Z distance. How deep into our virtual world from the camera do we want to start spawning stuff? So screen world to point. All three of these are just using a different method here to figure out where we should be spawning stuff in the world. Or how do we get this click position, this world position that we use eventually when we start spawning stuff and we set its own position. So you can use any of these. Um, in this case, I'm creating a float called distance. I'm adding it to this vector in the Z position. That's being added into this vector, which only has the first two positions, X and Y, and Z is zero. We add those together. We get one vector which has an X and a Y information coming from the Y and a Z information that we're controlling. And if you like the other methods, go forward and use them. But at the end of the day, you need to have user input um, for the rest of the class, and you can change it for the rest of the semester. And I'm just messing around with this script, this first script from last week, screen the world space, world point. So any questions on how we're just determining where we're clicking in screen space and then figuring out where that location should be in world space. Cool. 
Um, so we made these variables public. They're accessible through the inspector to us or other developers on our team or to other code. Um, usually developers are working in teams, rarely are you solo, which is why as you're making these scripts and you're messing around with these variables in the inspector, also you're giving this capability to other developers on your team. So notice that it's kind of hard to go, okay, a distance of five units, kind of interesting. Let's see what 10 units does. You know, click, save this script out, go back to Unity, wait till the script compiles, click play, test out the paint, see the paint stroke where the objects are cast into the scene, see if this is correct, if this is the experience you want to give your user. So we try to speed that up. We try to make um, testing, modifying, changing your variables as real time, as responsive as possible. And the first step toward that is making your variables public because then they're exposed into the inspector. So we also covered um, last week uh, prefabs so that you can, if you choose to, most of you will, move off of the Unity basic um, objects and you can create like multiple copies of them. You can group them together into one game object. You can rotate them, scale them, morph them, put different colors on them. So if I drag this bunch of spheres in here, it's just an empty game object which is holding all four, six of these so that we can only move all six of them together and position them into the game world. To when we create these prefabs, which are game objects, it's just we drag them. We create a bunch of game objects in our game scene. We're really happy with them. We put different colors, morph them. We drag them into our project view. What that does is it basically creates this data structure that's only existing in memory, only existing in your RAM, and it drags it and creates a copy of it on your hard drive, creates an external file, something that's permanent that we can reference later on, that we can bring with us as we build an application that the users can reference. And so this is how we're like dynamically, real time spawning these game objects wherever the user is clicking. To do that, we create a publicly accessible variable type game object, which is basically just a reference, a link. And we're just calling it something so we can use it. I just call it fancy because it's fancier. And um, by default, if I click off it, it's empty. It's not connected to anything. If we clicked play, we've got a bunch of errors. That's trying to reference this thing, trying to spawn it. And you can't find anything. So all we do is we kind of manually drag one of our prefabs onto it. Later on, we might do that by code, or we might switch it out on the fly. You might have different paint strokes, different objects. Um, during this class, you might have ideas of different, ide uh, different features you want to do. And I have a list from the other classes as they're seeing me do different things that their own ideas that they want to do. And some of them I'm going to do in the online videos. Most of the online videos are going to be heavy about the user interface, and then I'll show some stuff like we're going to show how the paint stroke can move forward and backward. So like if the paint stroke is spawning at a certain distance and that, that change value that's morphing that changing that, that um, distance over user input over time, if the spawning distance is getting too close to the camera, eventually you're just going to block the camera or your spawning distance might be behind the camera and it might never ever get random, uh, get rendered. So we're going to have this check where it's like if the distance gets too close, we're going to reverse the distance change. So if it's moving two units toward the camera every time, we'll reverse it and go away from the camera. And if it gets too far away, it gets too small, we'll reverse that distance change. So we'll get kind of this like fluctuating paint stroke um, where the mouse position is going to determine where in the X and Y that this these paint objects are being spawned, but we'll have this, this variable distance. Um, I'm destroying objects based on time. It's like I'm putting a timer on each game object, and after three seconds, I'm destroying it. But one student wants a button that like destroys all paint objects, basically like wipes the, the screen empty. He doesn't want to have a timer on the game objects. 
He wants the user to either click a button and, just, and wipe out everything, or if you click on objects, um, you can erase them or destroy them. So you can either click on each one and erase them, or click a button and erase everything. And one um, one student wants the objects to be like when they're spawned, they actually have physics on them. They actually like have gravity and they drop. And that there'll be this plane that when they drop down, they'll be destroyed. So as he's painting, all your paint strokes just are like dripping down, falling, and they end up getting destroyed. So these are some features I'll be exploring in videos this week. Um, if you have any other ideas you wish to explore, come talk to me after class. Come to lab time. Um, in fact, this is what actually this this student um, it's on the board. You can't see it on the, the video, but he wants to do fireworks. So basically, every time a user is clicking, it's spawning like a few different spheres randomly around the click point, and they just kind of pop into existence and disappear. And um, he wants to set how many stages of fireworks. So for example, you can randomly uh, change the number in the interface between like one and three. And say if there's three, there's going to be three timed explosions of fireworks. So right away there's one, we wait half a second, there's another one, we wait half a second, there's another. So, um, and, and he was confused how to go about that. So here, what we ended up talking about was that um, we go in the update the loop, we check if there's user input, if there's user input, we're going to check um, the stage, how many stages there are. So if stage number is greater than or equal to one, we're going to spawn our fireworks. It's a separate method call to spawn these fireworks. In that method call, there's, you know, spawn these random spheres with different, different scales, different colors, and then destroy them after a set number of time. And then we do another check. If stage number is greater than or equal to two, which is only true if that's set to two or three, we do this invoke method, um, which minimize, which uh, we don't have to worry behind the scenes, setting these timers. It just says, call this method after a delayed time. So we're invoking fireworks in half a second, which is our second set of fireworks. And then if stage number is set to three, we're invoking another set of fireworks a second later. All right, so as you get ideas, too, you can come to me. Um, the whole point of this class is about exploring coding um, through interesting, fun, interactive assignments, things that features that you're going to create for the user. So it's like once you get these ideas, you learn some stuff, you have some new ideas, how do you implement these, these features? So the first stage might be to write about them, like a project description. A second stage might be to test, uh, write out some user flows, get some discrete elements, stages of what might happen as a user is interacting with this. The third stage would be to go in and start coding it, maybe even writing some pseudocode first, try and get an idea of what you're doing, and then actually implementing your ideas in code. So in this case, we have um, distance and distance change. So distance change is a float which gets added into our distance variable. Um, and when you expose it like that, you can actually change it in real time. So I can say, okay, start at a far distance, make the change negative slowly, so negative 0.017, make it come toward the user. So as I dragged it, this paint stroke came into the the um, screen and went past the user. Now notice if I didn't have this destroy feature on it, it would just keep covering up the um, screen. So having this destroy after three seconds is actually useful for me during testing because I don't have to, to um, click stop and play over and over again. I can just change my variables, wait three seconds, let it clean up, change it again. So notice that it's showing me like the ending distance after it's moving. So I can change this again. Say, okay, I want a start point of say 10 units, and instead of going into the camera, let's go away from the camera. Looks like that. Let it clean up. Maybe I want to stay at this distance. Maybe I want to change it. You can enter the numbers manually, 
Or if you look over, if you drag over on the left a little bit, your, your arrows, you have these little arrows on your mouse icon, and you can kind of scrub left and right. So it's almost like the basics or beginnings of like a little user interface for yourself. So say I want to um, create spheres pretty close. Maybe I don't even want spheres. Let's try cubes. And um, a distance change, let's say no distance change at all. This is what that looks like. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Maybe I want a distance change move off from the camera. That's interesting. And now since I'm farther away from the camera, maybe pull in a little bit, reverse the distance change. It's super fast. It flew too quickly at me. It flew right past me. That, that's no good. So let me lower that distance change out. That's way too fast still. Let me drop it to maybe like negative one. Okay. So now I'm super close to the camera. Let me flip the distance change around. Now I'm back out. So you see I'm, I'm, I'm able to iterate, test out a lot of quick ideas. So maybe these are different paint strokes. Maybe these are different brushes. So maybe as I'm testing these out and I find interesting values, say it makes say a, a distance of 50 with a distance change of negative 0.0. That, that's a fun stroke. And maybe a distance of 10 with like a positive value of 0.9. Maybe this is something that's interesting. Whatever. Now, now I'm actually like setting what's what are known as like presets. Like when you ever select different brushes or different sizes of something, a bunch of different numbers are being changed behind the scenes. Different variables are being changed. But from your perspective, the user perspective, you're just like clicking different things. It's doing different features. So I could, if I wanted to, give my user a preset feature. Maybe there'll be like a drop-down user panel, and it says, oh, I want, a, I want a big brush, or I want the super small quick brush, and it sets the distance to this, and it sets the change value to that. But the user didn't see that and all those numbers change. They just say, I want this brush, I want this feature, I want that. And then when they select that different drop-down, your, your code changes a few different variables. Or maybe you want to expose those level of details to the user. Maybe you actually do want them to change the distance and then change the distance change uh, value differently. Maybe you want to expose those in sliders, which and at the end of this class, I'll expose those variables with sliders. Um, and all I'm going to have is just a slider changing numbers. But maybe you want to add more features to the user. Maybe you want to have a little label show the distance number, show the distance change number, or change a different prefab, and then change the size of it. And this is you building up your user interface toward your user. So step one, you start testing out some ideas in code. Step two, you'll start exposing those variables. For example, I made these variables public, showed them to myself or other developers on my team. Step three, would, it, it, we're going to get into is like kind of putting some safeguard on these variables. It doesn't make sense to put have distance variables behind the camera, so why make that available? Um, and then how to safeguard those variables to the user when ultimately you express them through the user interface. So this is great. This allowed for quick testing. I kind of like this feature. Um, we went in the right direction. I didn't have to scrap it. And it makes sense to expose different aspects of this feature. Now, how do we expose different aspects of this feature? So um, the first idea is I can expose the idea of these ranges. So there's these um, square brackets. And within it, I have range. Within there, there's two floats, a min and a max. So in this case, I started testing the distance of spawning objects from the camera. And I figured out it doesn't make sense to be closer to the camera than one meter. Otherwise, it's just filling up the whole camera view. And if it's negative, you're never going to see it at all. So I want to restrict the, num the distance values I can put in here to one. And maybe the objects get way too small past 30, 40, 50, whatever the number is. It doesn't make sense to spawn objects out that far. The user would never see them. 
So now I'm starting to put some safety values, some min and max on this. So this is a public float. Above it, I can specify what you can think of as like a modifier. Um, um, and if I save it, of the variables, this one only has this, this modifier on it, this range modifier. All right, so let, let the, the script compile. Once it compiles, notice how the variable and the inspector changed from like this input field. Now it's like the slider. The slider can only go to 1 and to 30, which you can change. So when you're creating scripts in your app, it, it's, each script kind of has a core functionality, a core feature. In this case, we're using a manager script that's dealing with user input, our clicks, are figuring out where should we should be spawning objects in the scene based on user input. When you're in that script and you're creating it and you're testing um, different methods, different variables, you're kind of like in a, a deep pocket of knowledge. You're focusing specifically on user input. But you might pop out of that script, look at your app, and figure, okay, now we're going to be working on something else, like uh, how do we change colors uh, how do we how do we open up a user interface to change the colors on the, the paint stroke or the objects? So you're moving over to a different feature, a different aspect of your app, and you're gonna forget details of this script of these features. So why not safeguard some aspects for yourself? You've already spent the time working in the script, messing around with it, modifying it, realizing that it only makes sense to spawn objects between one to thirty. So by creating this range. You can like walk away, and as you're messing around with other features and seeing how they now add to this to this app, and it might influence the distance. You might want to try out different things as you're working on other aspects of the app. Now you know, okay, I only wanted to place distances between one and thirty, and you should like be able to remember why. Or if not, there's also like tool tips. Like if you hover over, like a little text box will pop up and say. Remember, it doesn't make sense to spawn objects less than one or something. So that's something else that we could add to this, but we're not going to do that uh, in this class. So see how there's a reason, like a rationale for putting a safeguard on these variables. So um, that's ranges. And in fact, even with the distance change, you saw that as I was adding bigger values, it was either shooting off way too far or coming past the camera way too quickly, right? So I can put a range on my distance change. So notice how these modifiers only work on the variable that's declared right below it. You can declare multiple variables on one line, and they'll, they'll all be um, changed by whatever this modifier is. But we're working simply. We're only do, declaring one variable per line and you add your modifiers, what you see is fit. Now, as your scripts grow, there's going to be a whole bunch of variables that you're messing around with, and a lot of them will be internal. Like, you don't want your whole inspector to be bloated out. Sometimes you want to actually see stuff quickly. Sometimes you might do debug statements. Sometimes you might make stuff public or viewable in the inspector, but they're not meant to be modified. Sometimes I, you do want to modify them. As you saw, that I was able to make some quick decisions um, just messing around with these variables in the inspector. But by default, variables should be private. You don't want other scripts being able to change your variables because this script is the manager for user input. And it knows everything about user input. You don't want some other script that's saying, hey, I'm the color script. I want to change the depth of your paint stroke. Like, no, 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 you, you don't, you're not your responsibility. You don't, you don't have the core knowledge of distance. You shouldn't be messing around with that. This is the idea of like getter and setter functions or methods where it's like, it's okay if another script calls another script and says, hey, I want to change your variable. Do it through a method call though, because then you can safeguard it. You can say, oh, that you want to change my depth where I'm creating objects to negative one. That doesn't make sense. I've already determined that it's the safe values are between 1 and 30. So you can have these setter functions that, that act like changing variables, but you're doing it for your variables private, but your method is public. Other scripts can call your method and say, hey, I'd like to change your depth variable to this. 
I'm doing an interesting paint stroke, and I want to change your, your depth. But if, say, I want to change it to negative 2, and you can do a check, say, I only set my minimum to 1. Here you go. I'll set it to 1. That's the best I can do for you. So these ranges do a similar thing, and we'll be looking at um, setter functions later. Um, and so this idea of a public and private, you do not want all your variables to be public. And by default, we're still going to make everything private. But if you wish to still manipulate variables in the inspector as the developer, use this serialized field. So now we have like two modifiers on one variable. We're saying we're clamping it within a certain range. And we're saying, yes, it's private. No other script can mess with it. But it's serializable field, meaning that it'll be processed into this inspector and you, the developer, or anyone on the developer team, through the editor, can mess around with it still. In fact, if I go to, yeah. So this was one of the three scripts we did last week. This was creating, the, this was the third script. This was creating this mathematically infinite plane down here. We're not using, we're not creating our own prefabs. We're using Unity default um, primitives. And we're creating the primitive here. We're getting a, a we have a game object variable up here. We're storing a reference to it here. Then we're saying go to its transform, go to the position of the transform, and set it equal to this click position. So if I just turn the sphere on real quick, every game object has this component called transform. Secretly behind the scenes is just another C sharp script, but it's wrapped up to look like this transform and you can access it, access it and its methods and data variables. In this case, we're looking at the position, which is a vector three, has three floats and X, Y, Z, and that's its position in, in the world. And then we can set it what looks like we're just taking a variable, we're saying, hey, you sphere that has this data variable of type vector three, which determines where your position is in the world, I want it set it equal to this click position, which is wherever the mouse is plus some depth, which is another vector three. But as I hover over it, notice how it says um, it's a get set. It's actually these methods. It just looks like you're saying, I know that this is a vector three data variable, set it equal to this vector three. In reality, you're calling a method, which is just called position, the same as the variable. And the method reads in some input. In this case, it's looking for a vector three. And it does some safety checks. Is it really a vector three? If it's only a vector two, well, I'm going to have to add a, a third component, a Z, and I'll just set it, act, uh, set it to a default of zero. If it's a vector four or five, I'll trim off the stuff and I'll just take the first three. If he's passing in three floats, I'll convert it to a vector three and I'll set my data variable there. If it's something insane, like uh, I want to set X to 9,500, this and that, and set Z to negative 8 trillion, no, this is... These numbers don't make sense. I only work between these ranges. I'll set to whatever my permissible max or min is. If you're passing in an int, I'll convert it to a float for you, make this vector. Um, if you're passing in a string or something that doesn't make sense, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send out a, a warning message to you. And then I'll set my own variables because I'm the vector three class. I understand my data variables the best. Let me change my variables based on what you wish. So that's this idea of getter and setter methods. And as you um, create your scripts, you're going to have to create your own. And I'm actually kind of doing that with these ranges. I'm, I'm setting permissible min and maxes on these variables. They're just exposed as these kind of pseudo user interfaces. In fact, they are user interfaces just for other developers. The next stage is if we're really happy, 
and we found all these ranges and different um, ways we wish to change the, these parameters in safe ways, we're going to expose all that to the user through real user interfaces and actually give them as features to the user, not just to our fellow developers. I had one more thing I was going to say about that. I forgot. Yeah. It will come back to me later. Um, oh, in fact, we will actually. We'll take that last step. We will create these user interfaces. We'll create a slider. The rest of these online videos will cover all these different aspects of user interfaces in more in depth. Um, for you to develop this for you, for your sprint project. Yeah. On the uh, screen for world print script, what uh, what is the line of code that makes the game objects destroy over the recent right. period okay. of time? Uh, yeah, I've been talking about it, but I didn't I didn't actually move into it. So, um, I am going to be destroying my game objects or my paint objects or whatever you're calling them over time. Um, on the videos, I'll show you how to do it with like, okay, let's click a button and destroy everything in the scene, or let's click on stuff, which is actually the same script functionality. It's like these objects are spawned, they have colliders on them, and we're going to put uh, another feature. It's just another script that says, if I get clicked, destroy myself. Or the script, we can also have, if I click out into the world and it's a collider, and if that collider is a, a paint object, those physics layers I was showing you in the last videos, destroy that object. Yeah. Is, is destroy something you did or was that all? No, so this is a Unity function. Um, so let me see if I wanted to. So the first step was to create primitives. We created Unity default primitives. These are not prefabs. These are not custom-made objects that you will make and save on your hard drive. We're creating this. We're storing a reference to it. We're remembering what this object is. And then once we know that, we can also destroy it. So even if it was a Unity default or a prefab, at the end of the day, it's a game object. It's a copy of your prefab that lives in your game world, and we can destroy it. So how do we do that? Well, the script that I left off last week was this instantiate function. It did not have this reference connected to it. It just said instantiate this prefab called fancy at this location, click position, at this rotation, quaternion identity, which is just rotation zero. If I want to destroy it, I have to remember it, I have to remember its reference, where it lives in memory. So a, a common mistake is to just call the instantiate function and then call the destroy function, but call it fancy, or the reference of calling it. This would not destroy the game object in the game world, the copy of it. This would actually destroy the file that you're referencing. So what happened is you would say, okay, there's this game object called Fancy. It's a public game object. The reason for that is so that it we have this connection up here in our inspector so that we can drag in which file we're referencing. Later on, we might choose to do that with code. But right now we're, we're doing it manually. We're just saying this is the file I'm referencing. And then it, it makes a copy of it. It pulls it from the hard disk, copies it exactly, puts it in memory. Every time the user clicks, 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, we're just making copies. But that fancy, that's a reference keyword that's referencing our file, our external file, our prefab. So if we call destroy, it would actually delete that file. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is create another reference. In this case, I call, I'm creating a game object variable. It's just a reference. 
to whatever we're creating. In this case, I'm calling it temp geo, temp game object. And I'm setting it to whatever we instantiate. Fancy just happened to be the blueprint, it happened to be the class, not the object that was built from that class. We create these copies, we save references to them, and then we call this unity method called destroy. And we can actually destroy right away, or we can set a timer on it. In this case, I'm saying destroy it three seconds later. So basically, every time we're um, this update loop is running, you know, all the time, and it's checking is there user input. If there's user input, it spawns these objects wherever we're clicking. Every time that there's user input and these objects are spawned, we're also creating a game object variable, which is just a link. It's saying this thing was created, a copy of this, this file, link to it. Spawn, spawn, link, link, link. So we're just making these little links every time we're going through this link, uh, up through this loop. And we can have hundreds of these living in our application during runtime. And every time we're linking to it, we're at the same time setting up this little timer method that says, hey, remember this object. Here's a link to it. I'm going to forget about it. But it's your responsibility to remember it. And three seconds later, I want you to destroy it. So at any time as you're spawning all these game objects, all these little loops, these little threads are being spawned off and remembering, oh, remember that game object? How much time is left? How much time is left? Destroy it, destroy it. And then it's destroying itself. So later on in class, we'll learn about coroutines and separate threads or multi-threading. But we have one main thread that's running on our CPU. And the core of it, our art app, is right now we just have this click manager, and it's just checking as quickly as it can is there user input. And if it is, it's spawning. And if it's spawning, it's going to pull off these little threads that have their own little timers connected to it. So don't worry about the main timer, the main gain loop, what have you. When your timer's up, just destroy that object you're pointing to. And so that's what this destroy method is. But it's important to understand this reference link are to the copies we're creating, not to the file. And we're creating and destroying all these copies. And I'm doing it time-based. But over the videos, I'll show you if you want to create a button. Or if you don't want to do it time-based, you want to leave it up to the user. He's painting. Or maybe you want to keep track of, okay, there's only a th I'm only going to allow myself 1,000 spawns. Once I reach that, you know, I'm going to destroy everything. Or I'm going to... Tell the user you can't paint anymore. You got to destroy stuff, or you you know you can move off of my interaction design, which is time based. Um, so that's that destroy function. So any any comments on that? So as we currently live with the current setup here, I can kind of figure out what makes sense and then it kind of deletes itself. So now I'm, I'm, it's a very responsive feedback to me, the developer. I'm changing these numbers. I'm changing the functionality of what they do. I can even change different objects I'm spawning, see what I like, what should I be offering to the user. I know that somebody gave me these requirements or I made these requirements myself. And I'm trying to figure out the code that actually implements these requirements, these features. And it's really fast for me to figure out what I should be doing. All right. So let's see. It's 3. There's a class over it. 350? 350? Yeah. All right. So you have 25 minutes. There's, now there's there's two main parts of the class left on, for the live part. One is I'm going to start sh I'm going to move into showing you how to randomize scale and color. Um, and it's meant for you to see that there's many different things that you could do. 
um, many different features. The core gist of it is come up with some ideas now that I've exposed what's available. Try to figure out how to code that. Try to make parts of your code accessible to the inspector for yourself to quickly modify and find interesting iterations on. And which of those are combinations of those should you expose to the user through the user interface? Um, so week three, yeah, random scale and color. Okay. So this is a new script, random scale and color. Let me make sure I commented out this stuff. The whole script is the um, third input script. Just It makes an infinite sized plane that you don't see. And it just uses that to, as the collider area to paint on. But you can use any of the inputs moving forward. This is just where this script is at. So we're back to just creating primitive spheres straight from Unity's default collection, default um, enumeration. Remember here, if I remove this, just use a dot operator. It's like a customized little built list that somebody at Unity built for you. And these are the, the primitives that you have access to. So we're going to choose the sphere object of this enumeration. So we create this object. We save a reference to it. This is a private global game object variable. We only use it within the script to keep remembering what this primitive is every time we spawn it. Right now, we're just changing its position based on the click position. So I'm going to open up this line of code. And as you see here in our little notes, it says we're going to start randomizing the color and, um, and scale. So um, before I go through the script, I'm just going to create a sphere. I'm going to reset its position. I'm going to remove the collider just to make things simple to look at. I'm going to press the R key, or you click on this scale tool up here. And as I scale it in different directions, notice that I can scale in the X. The values change up here. We're dealing with a transform variable. I can scale it in the X, scale it in the Y. We can scale it non-uniformly. Or I can go back to its default shape and just scale it from the center, which just scales all three numbers at the same time. And it keeps its original shape. It just grows or shrinks it. Um, notice that these it doesn't make sense to have a scale of zero. The shape would just be non-existent. You don't scale negatively. It would just flip the, the shape. So we can grab that with code. So we're going to go to the transform of this game object we spawn. We're going to grab its scale. It's just called local scale. It's just a catch. And we're going to put in a new vector 3. Again, it's an x, y, and z. Three floats into a vector 3, very similar to position. But in this case, we're going to introduce this idea of randomness. So this random class is coming from the Unity Engine library. And you can use it by just saying random.range. There's many methods to it, we're, and we're just using this range, which says put in a min and a max, and I'll give you a random number between it. So for the x, I'm getting a random range, a random number between 0.1 and 1. So remember, I'm not going to 0. I'm not going negative. I'm kind of safeguarding. I'm only going up to 1, which, as you saw, makes a sphere that's you know of a smaller size, but it's not going to like fill up the whole screen. So if you want to, you can change these numbers, you know, 2, 3, 10, whatever. But you find those numbers that are appropriate to you. And in fact, and probably in Sprint 2, I'll change these to be floats up here. I'll, I'll make them serializable field. I'll, I'll put a, a scale on them. I'll figure out what makes sense, a range on them. And then we'll be able to manipulate them as developers. And if we really like what we're doing, we expose it out to the user interface to the user. But for now, I'm just kind of hard coding in some values just to see if something works. 
So an x gets a random number from 0.1 to 1, y gets a random number from 0.1 to 1, z gets a random number from 0.1 to 1. So I could have just made a float variable and done a random range and assign it to it, and then assign it to each one, but they would have all gotten the same random number. So let's say the random number is 0.3, the x, y, and z would have all been a 0.3. So we would have gotten random spheres, but they would have all been uniform. But in this case, every variable is going to get a random number generated for itself. So we're going to get spheres of different distortions. But they're all going to be of a kind of a smaller nature. So if I click play and I'm painting, remember I'm painting on this kind of infinite plane right in front of the camera. And I could do the quick paint. And, but notice that we're just getting spheres that are kind of mushed about, and their values are randomly between 0.1 and 1. That's pretty straightforward. Color is a little, it's going to take a little bit more explanation. So since we're already talking about the random range, let me talk about the right side, the assignment first, and I'll talk about how I'm getting to the left side. So color happens to be represented in four values, RGBA, red, green, blue, and alpha are opaque or transparency. We're only dealing with fully opaque objects. We're not dealing with transparency right now. Later, we'll deal with transparencies. So notice how the fourth value is this hard-coded, static, stationary constant. It's one. It's 100%. It's opaque. We're not dealing with transparencies. Now I have three values. We're going from 0 to 1. How much red? How much green? How much blue? And we have a new vector for different data structure, four floats. And we're putting that into the color value. So when we created materials last week, red, green, blue, all this kind of stuff, say purple. I was just duplicating out these, these materials, and all I was doing was changing this color right here. This is all we're, going, we're doing, but we're doing it with code, and we're just randomizing it. And at the end of the day, I put in those three sliders and allow you to change how much red, how much blue, how much green. I'm just clamping down that zero to one on each of the three. So to understand color range, let me first just go to RGB. 0 to 255. These are like different metrics of the same value. It's like Celsius and Fahrenheit. At the end of the day, you're, you, you only have a set number of colors that you get to pick from. But we're dealing in 8-bit color range. Our 2 to the 8 are 256 values per color. So we have 256 values of red we can pick from, green, blue, and they all get mixed together to make whatever your color is. We don't deal with 0 to 255. We're going to deal from 0 to 1, which just that, that value range is converted over from 0 to 1. There is 16-bit, um, 32-bit color ranges, but for digital media, uh, multimedia, web apps, what have you, it's, we're all dealing in, a, in an 8-bit color space. It's, it's enough color range to make things look visually interesting while keeping your, your memory footprint of these, these color values small. So as you see here, as I'm moving red, we're changing color, and I, we're moving green, we're changing color, we're moving blue. It's actually simpler to understand this color space or how colors are dealt with on the computer with HSV, or hue saturation value. So as I move along this outer color wheel, we're changing the hue. Notice this, this H value is changing the hue. So this is like what the color is, red, green, blue, purple, whatever, the whole rainbow spectrum. There's only 256 values it can be. So and let me pick like uh, something easier, like this yellow to see. And as I move the S, our saturation in our 0 to 1 space, or 0 to 100 in this situation, we're moving left to right in this little box in the middle. So this is how vibrant, how saturated your color is. We're not moving the hue. We're not moving, changing colors. If there's no saturation, it's completely white. 
it's fully saturated, you get like a really vibrant color. Notice as I move through the hue space, no matter anything, if it's no saturation, it's white. This is like your previous color. This is your current color. Um, I'll pull the saturation up. Notice V is for value. Value is how bright, how illuminated something is. So if something is not illuminated, it's dark, black. No matter what the value or the saturation is, it's always black. So normally, um, when you move into your web projects, just something simple to remember is try to pick a color that's saturated at like 70%. It's deemed like not good design to have something super saturated. So like an S value of 70 and a V value or a brightness of like 90. And then you can pick anything from the hues. Like use those type of colors for your systems integration, for your portfolio projects. But when we grab with code, we're going to be dealing with RGB in a 0 to 1 space. How much red, how much green, how much blue. So as I create a sphere, there's other components besides the transform. We want to get to the render. On the render, we want to get to the material that's connected. The material that's connected, we want to get to its color. The color is a vector 4, which we can change. So the primitive is a reference to the game object. You can see that we're coming down from the renderer to its material to its color. All that should be rather familiar except this part, this get component. So when we're grabbing the transform, like this dot transform, go down to its position, we're actually doing this behind the scenes. We're doing this get component. So find game objects, get game object, go down its component list and find stuff. Actually, your scripts are components as well. Any component is a C-sharp script. It's just Unity built scripts are all fancy. They have little icons. They have UIs built out. Your scripts can get to this point as well. You can make these little icons. You can make all these user interface elements. I'm just doing something very simple with you, little ranges and what have you. The transform is a required component. Every game object has to have a transform. It doesn't make sense to not know its location. So that's why you can do a shorthand of just saying dot transform. But when you want to grab other stuff, for example, the mesh render, and then find this material, you have to say get component. What component are we looking for? The render. We could say animators. You can even say your own scripts. So for example, if I had a script called Eric script, and it was a real script, and it was attached to this game object, and you wanted to reference it and change variables, or smarter yet, call setter methods on it to change its own variables, you would do it through this way. You'd say, go find this game object, change these attributes, these methods on these scripts, these components. For this situation, we're calling the mesh render. So get component. It's a method. Here's its curly brackets that end that method call. Those curly brackets are empty. We're not feeding in any input. But we have to say what type of component we're using. So since this method can work on almost any type of data structure, um, it's um, using this, this templatized or this abstract way to reference stuff. So we're not going to get into that in this class. Just know that it's using these little angled brackets, these little maybe like right and left carrots. It's saying we're calling a method called get component. It needs to know what it's being called on, what it's looking for. In this case, we're looking for components of type renderer, and we're ending our method call. So this returns a reference to a component. You can feed that into a variable, and you can do a check. You can say if get component renderer, 
And if it's null, you can do a check, meaning it didn't find any render on this object. You know, do something or don't do something else. If there's a render, do this. Um, in this case, I'm not safety proofing it that well. I'm just saying I know that there's a render on this game object. I know because I created it or because it's a primitive type. Find its material, find its color, set it equal to a randomized color. So I'm going to save that out. Let it build, click play. I'm going to get that sphere out of here. And here I'm painting randomized spheres with uh, a random scales and random colors. This actually is the end of my demo script. Yeah, I could make um, oops. I can make this destroy function active. Destroy this primitive after three seconds. And this is it. This is my demo app. This is the functionality I got to in that you'll get to something similar at the end of this week. Now, the last trick is how to start building a user interface to start opening up all these features that you've discovered, you've implemented on, you've safeguarded, you've found min-max values, you've done whatever. How do you make user interfaces to, to expose these features to your user, to add more features to your user? So for that, I'm going to jump back to yep, I'm going to jump back to my click detector. So here we are. We have the screen to world point. We have our little ranges set up in our inspector. All right, we can change them. This is being painted out 30 units out. This is being painted out five units out. This is being painted out 20 units out and gets a little bit closer to the user. Awesome. Let's say that's approved. That's a great user feature. Let's promote this from a dev user interface to a user user interface. So I am just going to create um, a slider and just quickly, I have like seven minutes, I'm going to quickly go over user interface, but the full details are going to be um, in the online lectures. So we have different user interface elements. We have texts, we have images, uh, buttons, toggles on off, sliders, drop down menus. Um, we have input fields. We're not going to use that. So like entering strings and processing them and doing stuff on that. We, we, we will be like presenting strings back to the user. Those are the text fields. Um, but for now, I'm just going to create a slider. When I create that slider, a few different game objects were created. Um, a, this is my user interface element. I happen to choose a slider. All user interface elements have to live on a canvas. Though usually a canvas has multiple, you know, it's like labels and, and sliders and toggles and all this stuff. And even your user interface might be context sensitive. It might change based on what the user is doing. But for now, I just have a, inner, a, a canvas with a slider on it and this event system which is a separate game object. It's almost like a manager. It's encapsulating, abstracting a lot of the details um, of user input and processing that data into the user interface and then allowing you to connect your scripts to that user interface. A lot of this has been simplified for you so that we can just go ahead and start using user interface elements. This canvas here, um, exists in screen space, not world space. Later on, you might choose to have like multiple canvases. Some might be exist or might spawn with your objects so that you have like a little text label with every object you spawn, or maybe it makes sense to have little buttons and clicks with stuff that's spawning. But for now, we have one user interface. It's being spawned in screen space. So all the default settings of this canvas. I'm going to turn on this ground plane. Press the F key. This is like our world space, our virtual playground that we're 
interacting with. We're building stuff there. Right now, it just happens to be like 10 units or 10 meters by 10 meters. Notice as I click over onto the canvas, press the F key. It's much bigger. It's off to the side. It's meant to do that. It's meant to be like not of the same scale so that when you're building stuff in your world, you don't have to worry about this user interface. It's just this massive crazy thing off to the side that's just rendered straight to the camera. As I pull out, see how there's this white line. This represents the actual game view, what's rendered to the camera. Here's my slider. It's way off to the side. Notice as I move to the move tool and I move it into view, it, it actually gets rendered to the camera. I was, as I'm moving it, notice how it's this position right here, this X position that's updating. I can go and click reset position. It zeroes it all out, puts the slider right in the middle of the user interface. I'm just pressing the F key. I'll zoom up on it. And um, I use this little box to move left and right up and down at once. And I'm just going to position it up in the top left of my camera view. Notice as I move the game view that the user interface isn't coming along for the ride. So it's in like an absolute position. So don't worry about it. Just get your game view um, organized, laid out for right now so that you can just build a user interface. In the online videos, I'm going to go through like these anchor points and all these like uh, position situations so that like the user interface will scale with a windowed view. Uh, notice that the slider component has a min and a max, very similar to this range value that you just used in the inspector. So let's say that um, this slider, if I have time, I'm going to create two sliders. The other class is only really creating one. I'm going to try and create one for our distance and one for our distance change. So I come in here and I noticed I already figured out that I want my distance to be between 1 and 30. That made the most sense for this aspect of my feature. So I can go in here and say min value 1, max value 30. And I can even set my default value. Maybe by default, I want to spawn these objects 10 units out, 10 meters out. Notice how 10 is kind of like a third between 1 and 30. And notice how my, my visual scale updated accordingly. So this is what the user will default to. Um, so the slider is all set up, ready to go. Now, on value changed, we can use this handy little GUI to connect up our script. We don't have to do it with code. So I can click here and say, when this value is changed, we're going to run a method. But what method are we going to run? Well. We know that this click detector manager is in charge of the distance that we're spawning objects. That is what we want to change. Right now we're doing it through the inspector, only available to developers. So we're going to, um, let me get rid of the range, because in the other classes, like the both UIs were updating at once. So I'm going to get rid of the, the UI, set it equal to 10. And we have to introduce a method, a setter, since our variable is private. This is a public method, public void. It doesn't return anything, it just does some stuff. And I called it something appropriate, change distance, capital C. It's not a, a variable. Methods have camel case, but start with uppercase. And we're actually reading in something for once. We don't just have uh, an empty input parentheses. We're actually reading in a float, which is going to be passed from our user, um, yeah, from our user, our uh, user canvas. And we're calling it something because we want we want to use it in some way. So we're just it's going to be passed in. We're going to call it change. And we're going to say whatever changes set distance to. We're not even doing any checks or anything. Just go right ahead change our variable, we're fine with it, because I've already spec'd out my user interface. I said 1 to 30. That's all you can do. So uh, one way or another, I got my safeguards in. So I have uh, this public method, which is just going to change this variable 
And I got rid of this range here just so that we only have one user interface that's showing and not both are being updated at once. So now my distance, my float is just back to showing the number. So the slider needs to know, what am I changing? So I'm going to grab my manager object, connect it in. And then it needs to know what function on this game object. All these classes you create need to be components of game objects. All these classes have methods that we can call. So I created this method on my screen to world point script. And notice that there, there's a bunch of stuff that it's saying that I, I can, my, me be, being the slider, these are things I found on this script that I can change. But at the top, we have this dynamic float. It knows that because I've created this method that in its um, declaration says, I expect to read in a float. So it's saying, okay, I, have to, I found this method that can read in a float. So that's what I want. So whatever this value changes to, it's going to pass it into this script as a float, or it's going to pass it into this method. This method is going to change our distance variable. So I'm going to click on distance. I'm going to default it to 10. Click play. Spawn an object. It's 10 units out. Update my slider. Notice that this number changes. Now we're 24 units out. Update it really close. And notice that this slider has connected into these variables that we knew made sense. And now we're exposing it to the user. Let me get rid of this ground plane. And notice that um, even when I use the interface, I'm still spawning an object. So this is why in my app, I, I reserve the I only checked for the right mouse click or right mouse drag to spawn stuff because I'm reserving left clicks to use the interface so that we don't spawn objects when we're using the interface. So this is like a little quick way to say, okay, I'm painting and I'm using the interface, but I don't want to spawn objects. Later on, we'll learn how to distinguish these clicks if we're interacting with the interface or the environment. But for now, you might want to think about reserve your right clicking, right dragging for painting, interactive, whatever it is, and then by default, your left mouse will interact with the user um, user interface. And so that's it. You can quickly just make a um, change distance delta and just change distance change, which is this one up here. It doesn't need to be a range. We know we're going from negative 3 to 3. I can just duplicate this slider, let the script compile, I guess, move the slider down. This slider is going to go from negative 3 to 3. We'll default at 0, put it in the center. The script it's going to change is change distance delta. I think that should be good. Click play. Go to click detector so I can see my numbers. Now it's indicating to me that, oh, I should have some more elements to my user interface. I should really pull in some text objects and display these numbers so that the user can actually see what they're doing. But we can change a, a big distance and make it negative, meaning fly in. Or I can make a close distance and make the delta difference, meaning fly out. And now we have some more features given to the user. That's it. But you need much more cleaned up, refined user interface, some labels, scale them nicely. I'm going to show you how to make them stick in their relative space. Um, and you're going to think about what you wish to expose to the user, drop downs and, and what have you. So you got to get to the point where you make your own deliverable. And now that you've seen more features and you want to experiment more, and you actually code stuff and it works, you can go back, change your user, your, your project description, change your user flows, get a link up there, get a nice little clean interface, as I'll show you in the videos throughout this week. Say I want cubes that are mixtures of red and blue. And notice maybe in my stretch goal here, I can add in a distance and a distance delta. 
All right. So please do this test, which is shown here, as soon as you can. If you have issues, come into lab time. That way, for the rest of the week and into the weekend, you're just making these features, same workflow. Think about some interesting things you'd like to do. Try it out in code. If it works well, expose those features through variables into your inspector. So as a developer, you can quickly modify them, mess around with them, see what you like, and then think about how you want to expose that to the user. That's it. So come see me if you have questions. Hopefully that made sense. If you have some interesting ideas you want to implement on, for example, the ones I gave at the beginning of class, which I'll be doing online videos on, people want the objects that be active physics objects drop down as you're painting them, be deleted as they get too low. Um, don't do time-based erasing, have like a button to erase everything. Or if you click on objects and you register, you're clicking on a collider, delete whatever that uh, game object is that has that collider, erase. Um, or maybe have this different type of paint strokes, maybe stuff, paint strokes that are coming toward you. And then when it gets too close, it comes back. Or maybe different presets, as I was talking about. There's quite a bit you can play with just off this scoped project. And then next sprint, we're going to learn more stuff. You're going to have a more wider range to play around with. So the trick is get some ideas, scope them reasonably using user flows or some way to map out what you think this experience might be. Try to code it up. Use some pseudocode to get your ideas out. Um, expose those features in the inspector. Then bring those features into um, the user interface and repeat until you have a large prototype at the end of the class, bug free, nice clean user interface. You're good to go. Oh, yeah, you could.